Whenever I was feeling lonely or depressed or anxious, I would always turn towards porn. So it, it became an, an outlet to escape from reality. Hello and welcome, fellow human. My name is Zachary Stockhill, and you are listening to Humans in Love, a podcast that looks at culture, relationships, and personal development from unconventional perspectives. Join me as I dig into the question of how people like you and I might get more out of life and love. Thanks for being here. Coming to you from a hotel room in Vientiane, Laos. Welcome to Humans in Love. Yes, I am on the road this week. I had to make an emergency visa run to Vientiane. I had to get a new visa for Thailand. Long, boring story. I won't, uh, I won't bore you with it. But this is my first uh, international episode, I guess, of, uh, of this podcast. I'm excited to share this one today. I think this is easily one of the most raw and revealing conversations that I've yet had for this podcast. Gold Jacket Luke is a very popular YouTuber. He makes videos about topics related to psychology and personal development. And more recently, and perhaps what he's best known for, is making videos about the dangers of pornography, the benefits of not viewing pornography, not masturbating, and learning to better circulate and use your sexual energy. And frankly, when when he first came on my radar and I started watching his videos, I was pretty impressed by his candor, by his openness, by the fact that he was willing to reveal some pretty raw and some might say embarrassing aspects of his life, such as, you know, his, as he describes it, his addiction to pornography. So anyone who has the balls to do that is, um, is a pretty cool guy in my books. And Luke recently moved to Chiang Mai where I live. So I was excited to invite him to my kitchen and have a conversation about all of these related topics. In today's discussion, we get into everything I just mentioned, you know, pornography and masturbation and the dangers of pornography and how we can all use our sexual energy a bit more wisely. If you're enjoying this podcast, please be sure to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast app of choice. They really mean a lot to me and they do a lot to help spread the word about this show. So without any further ado, I present to you, Mr. Gold Jacket Luke. Gold Jacket Luke, welcome to my kitchen. (laughs) It's an honor to have you here. This is a great pad. I'm really digging it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you for for inviting me on for this. Yeah, absolutely, man. So... I have a bunch that I want to talk about with you. I want to talk about the YouTube game. I don't know. Do we, what do you call it? The YouTube business? <laughs> YouTube game, sure. Yeah. Uh, and I want to talk about things like pornography and masturbation and all that juicy stuff. Uh-huh. Um, but first off, I'm curious about your background. Mm-hmm. Um, so where did you grow up and where did this interest in, in personal development come from, would you say? Yeah. Um, I grew up in, in LA. That's where I was born and raised. Um, and I've always been a pretty like deep thinker um and I, I i think just with the invention of the internet i was just googling a bunch of stuff all the time about every question i had about life and in high school here or? yeah um starting in high school i'd say yeah um and being a high schooler lots of that stuff had to do with, with girls <laughs> of course um, so uh, I think that's one of the main reasons I got into uh, personal development stuff was like researching stuff about being a, being a better person, but also largely about how to connect better with girls because I was super awkward with girls in high school. Yeah. I've seen some stuff on your channel about, uh, social anxiety and that kind of thing. Like, yeah. were you kind of like held back, reserved? What kind yeah, of a kid were you? Definitely. Um, I'd say, uh, like, I, I remember even in, uh, like, third grade, uh, when my parents took me to church, I just, like, didn't talk to uh, any of the other kids in, like, the youth group. Um, I have memories. Um, I've always had a bunch of really good friends, so it, it was never anything really extreme. Like, I, 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 I've had an awesome childhood. But looking back, 
when I was pretty young, I definitely had social anxiety and just not the best ability to, to just connect with other people. And I'd say it got a lot worse once I got, once I hit puberty in regards to, especially like girls and just like fitting in. But um, I was never like an extreme case. I always had lots of awesome friends and I've, I, I had a great childhood. So, um, but that's, that's something I've always struggled with is just having social anxiety. Yeah. In case your parents are listening, you had a great childhood. <laughs> we have that on the record. Um, okay. So you're in high school, you're trying to figure out how to get better with girls. Um, um, and what's the deal? You kind of stumble into other topics, other subjects. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, a lot of it was the girl stuff and some like pickup artist stuff. I went through a phase with that. And, um, I, I also got into some spirituality stuff, just, um, part of the, like the law of attraction and things like that kind of had a sway to me. Um, and just like different, um, um, different philosophies and just different things that really, I guess, just stimulated my, my brain. Cause like school didn't really stimulate my mind. So just reading like different philosophies and theories and personal development stuff online, it just really kind of woke me up in a way. And when did you start, when and why did you start YouTubing? Yeah, um, I started YouTube in 2012 with two friends and we started with making uh, prank videos and um, kind of like <sighs> comedy picking up girls videos, um, social experiments. And Have you seen any of the simple pickup guys? Yeah. The, okay, so similar to that. The, 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 they were one of the, the big inspirations for us to start doing that. Yeah, they were funny. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, so we saw them doing that. And then I was doing lots of that stuff just like during the day or at night. And I started thinking it'd be awesome to make a YouTube channel too because I really like simple pickup. And what kind of stuff were you doing? Um, so one of them was like proposing to random girls. Just, hey, will you marry me? Um, one of them was, I was in like a Santa Claus outfit. And picking up girls, like we did that during Christmas, like picking up girls with Santa. <laughs> did you have the beard? I, 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 we, we rented like a $200 suit. Oh, like, wow. like it was $200 to rent. We, we went all out. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of our big ones was picking up girls with a fake boner. Oh. <laughs> we got a, um, a dildo put in our pants and went up to a bunch of girls and tried to get numbers. With, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, we actually got a decent amount of numbers. <laughs> it was now, surprising. Yeah, would the women acknowledge the, the elephant in your pants? Or? Uh, quite often, yeah. It, it was a, a very big dildo. <laughs> and what, uh, what did you gain from those experiences other than just a good time, I guess? Yeah. Um, um, one thing I gained was, was just a good uh, practice of getting out of my comfort zone and forcing myself to engage with girls and just feeling anxiety, but facing it and pushing through it anyways. Um, and I, th I, I think another thing was I kind of felt like, um, at first when I first started doing it, I thought I'd be doing it for a long time, but I quickly lost my, my passion for it. I only ended up doing it for about six months Your passion for, what exactly? for, I guess, doing the prank videos and the picking up girls videos. It, it started to feel kind of like fake. Like I realized the place I was coming from, from doing it was to get uh, social validation. <laughs> like I want to look at me, I could pick up all these girls and like we were getting lots of views. And I realized the place I was coming from and doing those videos was to like try to be cool and get YouTube views. But wait, you're saying there's more to life than social validation. <laughs> I, I don't follow. I don't. <laughs> I, there might be a okay. I, I, <laughs> stop the presses. <laughs> so, um, after about six months, I started to have some business disagreements with one of my partners. And at the time I, like, I've always been really passionate about, yeah, the personal development and spirituality and dating advice. So at first I thought I'd make another channel where I'd talk, talk about my ideas about life and do, do the, like the pranks and picking up girls videos at the same time. But um, after I started making some of my own videos, just talking and me losing my passion for the prank videos, I was like, you know, I'm just going to get get my uh, part of the YouTube channel bought out and focus only on the, the gold Jack Luke um, talking head type of videos. Okay. And that was in 2013. And I've been doing the gold Jack Luke videos. Yeah. So for over five years now. And why gold jacket, Luke? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, back when I used to 
party quite a bit. I I would like go out with this like bright gold jacket from American Apparel. It was just just to be ridiculous. You still have it? Uh, I <laughs> I it actually got stolen. Oh, you're kidding? <laughs> yeah. So now but, you're um, no jacket. But but um, I, I I bought another one. Okay. Yeah, I I actually bought bought two new ones. <laughs> so yeah, so I have a. Yeah. <laughs> so plural gold jackets, Luke. Yeah. Very good. Um, I have my backup. Yeah, yeah. That's good in case another one gets stolen. I had my favorite jacket got stolen years ago in Chile. Yeah. I'm still trying to recover. From it. Oh man, I love that thing. Uh, another. I, I used to wear this American backwards hat like all the time, and um, there's this big festival in Isla Vista and um, called like Deltopia. It's just thousands of people kind of partying and one friday i lost during that festival i lost the hat and i was like really bummed because i i had it since i was like six years old <laughs> wore it a ton but um the next day on saturday i saw someone wearing the hat <laughs> oh you're kidding like yeah it, and are you sure it was just your, walk and, and was I, yours? I i ran up and like just grabbed it off <laughs> oh, and i actually um my mom when i was six wrote my name on the lid of the hat and i was like yeah this is my hat and they're like yeah that, that, i guess that is your hat <laughs> wow. i got it back that was that was just a cool experience that's like every theft victim's fantasy to actually catch yeah. the bastard like <laughs> using your thing or wearing your thing yeah or, yeah wow that i've was... never heard a story of that actually happening <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> Well, I guess, you know, to be honest, the main reason I wanted to talk to you and the thing that I, I'm, uh, I was really interested in, I guess I'm, because of my own experiences and the things that I've written about and, and the things that I talk about online, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it somewhat embarrassing personal stuff, I'm kind of in awe of you and some people like, like you who write about the real nitty gritty of, you know, your sexuality and your personal life and stuff. I find that really inspiring and pretty impressive. So I guess that's a good segue into talking about no fap. <laughs> so what is no fap and how did you encounter this, uh, what would you call it, community? Sure. Yeah. So no fap is the, um, fap is an internet, um, 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 slang for masturbation. Yeah, and it's it's supposed to mimic what the sound it makes or something. Fap, <laughs> yeah. fap, fap or something. Apparently, it, yeah. fap, fap, fap was from some like Japanese comic, oh, okay. and that the, yeah that that was kind of the original story, and then it, it just caught on, and people started using it, and then no fap came along, um, and it just spread like wildfire. So no fap is the practice of not masturbating, um, for the for the benefits of harnessing one's sexual energy. And I, I first got into that. I think I was just, I've always been into you know, personal development type of stuff. And I stumbled on the, there's a subreddit called Reddit NoFap, where that's kind of where the movement started. And that's like where the community is mainly located now. And I just started reading people's reports and I was like, hey, um, this kind of makes sense. I look at porn and jack off all the time. I've never really thought about this. Maybe I should try taking a break and see how I feel. And I did. And I felt a lot better. And so how old are you? I'm 26. Okay, so you're a little a little younger than me. I was just having this discussion with someone. I'm, uh, I'm about to be 31. Okay. I was just having this discussion with someone that I think, like, I was born in 87. And I think I was a generation, like, like the last generation before ubiquitous HD internet porn. <laughs> really, because I think, because yeah, I remember, I remember dial-up and stuff. Uh -huh. And, like, we didn't have, you know, I grew up in rural Ontario. Okay. And I remember we didn't have great internet. And what's more, I didn't have any privacy, really. <laughs> you know, I didn't have my own computer or anything, uh -huh. or a smartphone or any of that stuff yeah. until, you know, college. You're, um, you're fortunate. I guess so, yeah. And, and I'm really curious about the experience of young people, but particularly young guys, growing up with, I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, the first time I saw a naked woman, I remember, like, the, you know, cl very clearly, my friend, shout out to... <laughs> I don't know if he's listening. I remember his dad, uh, I probably shouldn't say that. I'm going to edit this out. A friend of mine, uh, <laughs> whose name I won't reveal, his dad had a pretty extensive collection of like 70s Playboys, right? So this is the, the golden era of pubic hair. So you couldn't even really see, you know, see the, uh, the whole picture, so to speak. But that, that was my, my brush with female sexuality at a young age in some ways, you know? We would, uh, we would seek out my friend's dad's uh, old Playboys. Nowadays, 
a 12 year old, a 13 year old can, can go that. online and find literally anything he wants. Yeah. Unlimited, high definition. It's insane. I mean, I can't imagine like what, what does that do to yeah. a young guy's sexuality? What, what does that do to his view of women? What does that do to his view of sex? Because I'm not talking about you necessarily, but if you grow up and the only exposure you have or the only real, you know, interaction you have with sex is masturbating to, you know, hardcore internet porn. Yeah. What, like, it, it's, it's mind boggling to me. Like, what does that do to your brain? And what kind of a lover are you going to be when you go out and get there with a real woman? You yeah, know, like, exactly. you're not going to know anything about the clitoris, anything about the G spot. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to know anything about foreplay. Um, so I guess like what I'm asking is, or what I'm curious about is, did you feel like you had like a problem with pornography? Did you feel oh, like it was, it was having a bad impact on your life? Definitely. Yeah. And, and why? Because some people look at it and say, well, what's the problem? No one's getting hurt. Yeah. Anymore. There's that. Um, well, for me, it was, it definitely turned into addiction. If whenever I was feeling lonely or depressed or anxious, I would always turn to or towards porn. Um, so it, it became an, an outlet to escape from reality. Um, and I, I also looked at it a lot, like sometimes every day, sometimes multiple times a day. So it's, it's something that's, that's always there. You know, you know, I've used the metaphor. It's almost like if an alcoholic had a beer in their pocket at all times, Exactly. It's um and yeah, there's millions of movies there now, porn videos out now, all sorts of different categories. Virtual reality porn is coming out. Yeah, that's gonna start to become more popular. Yeah. That's gonna what our kids are gonna deal with is yeah. VR porn. Yeah, oh, my God, there's like sex dolls. There's yeah. it's getting a lot worse, and especially with smartphones. So I didn't have, I think I got a smartphone, my first smartphone either, I think freshman year of college or senior year of high school. So I'm, I, I, I miss that wave, but yeah, some 13 year olds now have smartphones. So that's, that's really dangerous. But, um, yeah, I'd say the, the main thing for me was, it was like, I, I knew it was a problem when I told myself, okay, I want to stop looking at this. And then the next day or sometimes two hours later, I'd find myself looking at it. Um, it was, it, it was definitely an addiction for me. Like you really felt you couldn't control it. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. And did you try like those apps, you know, like to block certain websites? And... I did, but they're always really easy to get around. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, I, 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 yeah. Like I'm, I'm curious about, okay. So just, just to give some context, like I've, I've watched a bunch of your videos and stuff. But you've been doing this nofap thing for how long now? Yeah, um, almost 700 days. Seven. So what, that's almost <laughs> uh, two years? Almost two years. Yeah. And what does nofap entail for you, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, well, so nofap entails um, for me no masturbation. Um, and uh, I, I actually, I have been celibate for that 700 days too. Um, back before that 700 days, I, yeah, I was into some like pickup stuff and got a decent amount of like one night stands and superficial things and that never really made me happy. So about two, uh, two and a half, three years ago, I decided I, I want like something really real and intimate with a girl. Um, and it's just taken some time. So uh, I, I've been celibate, but no fap doesn't, the way most people define no fap is that they can, they can't have sex. Um, just, just no masturbation and no, and no porn. So you can't even masturbate without pornography. Yeah. Um, so yeah. N n um, no masturbation. Period. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something that I can I can relate to because, as you know, I have an interest in uh, tantra, yeah. in tantric sexuality. Uh -huh. um, and so when I found out that people like you were doing this no fap thing, mm -hmm. but correct me if I'm wrong, but they had no exercises to sort of transmute that energy and bring it up and stuff. I like I was like they're going to explode <laughs> like they're gonna, because in, in, in tantric sexuality and some of the things I'm interested in, uh -huh. you actively try to channel that energy through your old body. Right. Gotcha. And I can't imagine like doing nothing and just, yeah. Um, obviously people do it, you know, uh, people have done it, you know, for, for millennia, but. So, so I'd say, um, I, I, I've tried no fap back in, 2013, but it wasn't, um, I got into meditation, uh, in 2016 and at the end of 2016 is when I started this no fab streak. 
So I, I couldn't be here if it wasn't for meditation. Um, I meditate almost every day. And that's, that's definitely helped me with controlling. I don't do any special like energy circulation or anything like that. Just basic meditation, kind of mindfulness meditation. But that's helped me a lot. And how, how or why do you think it's helped you? I think it just... Um, like it, it just calms down my brain. Like if I'm having lusty thoughts or thoughts, I really want to look at porn right now. I really want to have sex. I really want to masturbate. If I could just sit still and be present with that feeling and focus on my breath. Um, sometimes it'll completely go away after 10 minutes or it'll at least be diminished a bit. Um, so it makes it a lot more manageable. And do you use an app or something or what do you uh, do? I, I just sit in a chair and meditate. Okay. Listen. Old school. Old school. Yeah, that's yeah. me too. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people are using, you know, headspace and all that yeah. stuff these days. Yeah. But yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't appeal to me as much. Well, first off, I mean, just kudos, man. Like, like, no, seriously, because, because, Thanks. and I think like for guys around our age and for everyone in general, porn is so normalized. It's like, yeah. you know, there's, there's just endless jokes about it in popular culture about, you know, jacking off to porn and, and, uh, it's, it's become a thing that, that I think we just assume on some level, it's not even normal, it's like encouraged by the culture. Yeah. Like this is how you relieve stress, you know. I, I mean, I've talked to guys who can't sleep without doing it, that kind of yeah. thing. And my own experience, I mean, of course I've looked at pornography, but it's just never, um, you know, off and on, but I, I, I've never had a problem with it. Um, I don't think it's necessarily wrong. I'm not certainly not going to get, mm. you know, sanctimonious and, and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. think I that agree. it's morally wrong or something. I mean, some of it, I think, is... Lots of it. Yeah, lots of it's pretty dark and twisted yeah. and messed up. But and, in and the general, industry could be pretty messed up, too. Yes. Yeah, there's actually, I'll link to it in the show notes for people listening, but I watched an incredible video. I wish I could remember the name of the guy. I'll find it. By one of the most popular porn stars, uh, a, a guy. Um from the 90s he was like you know in tons and tons and tons of films and it's just him talking for 10 minutes about the toll that it's taken on his psyche and on his life and and it's really interesting because usually we hear about the female perspective right yeah. we kind of assume on some level well it's worse for the women it's more you know psychically psychologically yeah. damaging for them but this guy's talking about the toll that it's taken on his life it's fascinating really i'll send it to you yeah, yeah it's really, really interesting yeah, and, and so, yeah, I guess I, I'm kind of ambivalent in some ways about pornography, but from, from my own life and from people I've talked to and stuff, I think more often than not, it's incredibly draining, uh, literally, mm -hmm. as well as, you know... Um, now, are, are you talking about masturbation, too? Yeah, uh -huh. and, but also I think that, that it just... Um, I don't know, I, I look at sexuality and sexual energy as such a resource, yeah. Uh, and it's a renewable resource and you can use it to fuel everything, you know, in your life. You can use it yeah. to fuel your relationship. You can use it to fuel your work. Yeah. You can use it to fuel your workout. You can yeah. use it to fuel your creative energy and some project you're working in, yeah. uh, working on. Um, I see it as such an incredible resource. And every time I do slip up and, and masturbate um, and watch porn, um, which isn't very often, but it happens once in a while. Uh -huh. I immediately feel drained yeah and and the next day is still I'm, I'm operating on a lower frequency I really feel that yeah. um, the next day and then I think well, why the hell did I do that that was you know very silly um, yeah and just yeah what, what's the point yeah. and and I'm someone who you know I would say I'm abnormally um, infrequent uh, porn viewer you know okay. but some people I can't imagine guys who are doing this every day or several times a day yeah it must just—it must just make you feel like very drained. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess you can speak to that. Or, yeah. I, I, well, what's what's the before and after? I guess like like how how is your energy level now? How are you feeling now compared to two yeah, years ago? Yeah. Um, I'd say it's kind of like benefits cr across the board, um, but like some people report feeling like superpowers, like they suddenly could talk to every girl and wake up at 5 a.m. and go into, um, I didn't experience much of that, but I'd say just across the board, I feel like 20 to 30 percent better, uh, more mental clarity, more confidence, less anxiety, less depression. Like it's not a magical cure all, um, but I definitely just across the, across the board feel a lot better. Um, I think a big one is how I see women. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I could definitely see women more for who they really are rather than just sexualizing them or objectifying them right away. That's something um, I didn't even really notice I, I had until I stopped looking at porn for a while. And then the porn and, and then women, I started to really change how I saw women. And it's like, if you look at porn all the time, since you were 15, you don't even really notice the subconscious effects that that has. Hmm. Cause you felt like you were seeing women primarily as sexual objects before yeah. on some level. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you still have those? Like we're now two years, you're, you're two years deep into this. Do you still have cravings and really tough <laughs> moments and stuff? And, and how do you yeah, deal with those? Yeah, definitely. And, um, I have been perfect with not masturbating, but a handful of times I've actually looked at porn. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't been like the lengths of time have been, it's only been like a couple times this year, but, um, it's, I definitely still get urges. Um, they're a lot less than how they used to be three, four years ago. It's like those neural pathways in my brain have diminished quite a bit. And then I feel like my ability to handle an urge has, imp- uh, has improved as well. So when an urge comes, I, I more uh, know how to, that this is okay and I can control this and to be present with it. But, um, so it, it, it's, um, way easier than how it used to be, but here and there, I definitely still get urges. Yeah. But do you think meditation helps with that as well? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So you, you mentioned also that you've, you've been celibate for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, after having some sort of mediocre experiences with one night stands and stuff. Yeah. And I know I'm heaping praise and congratulations on you, but I respect the fact that you're admitting that and you're owning that and saying, hey, like there's more to life than sexual conquests. Because as a mm-hmm. red-blooded 26-year-old guy, some guys will look at that and, I mean, you know, you yeah. grew up in America, I grew up in Canada. There's still this macho culture that assumes that, you know, if you're a young man not, you know, collecting notches on your bedpost, somehow yeah. it's, you know, you're less of a man or some bullshit yeah. like that. Uh-huh. Um, so congratulations for, yeah, like owning that. I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, no, I mean it. And, and like, are you, are you open to relationships moving forward, but you're just really holding out for something special, um, something in a special connection? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Ladies? I, I feel like, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, a big thing for me is, yeah, um, as Colvin, we met, you, you, you brought this up, is two years ago I read the book Keep It's Poisoned Arrow. And, um, by what's her name? By Marnia Robinson. Robinson. Marnia Robinson, yeah. Yeah, and um, that book really captivated me. And I'd like to find a girl who'd be curious about experimenting with Kreza. Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you talk like, about that book a bit? Yeah, so uh, um, Marnia Robinson um, wrote a book called Cupid's Poisoned Arrow. And um, the basic idea of the book is that um, there's another kind of style of making love called Kreza. And it's pretty similar to Tantra. And... Um, Krez is almost like no fap sex. <laughs> it's um, the the goal is that um, both partners don't orgasm during the sex, but it's this very like slow and gentle sex. And um, I haven't had it yet, so I'm just speaking from what I've read from the book. But basically, the um, the purpose of it is that um, is two things. Is one, she talks about the the draining effects of orgasm. Um, so kind of similar to no fap and how um, often when if couples are having normal fertilization orgasm driven sex that it could kind of demagnetize the couple because it's almost like they're like draining each other sexually um, so which is a really interesting uh, I, I thought that sounded really interesting um, I'm gonna have to explore it with myself and see if that's true but um um, so, so, so her kind of uh, hypothesis is that couples that if they can summon the strength to not, to not orgasm, <laughs> uh, which some people f- find to be like an impossible feat, that their relationships are much more like harmonious and, and loving, which uh, to me makes kind of sense. And I, I, I guess the other point is that in Carreza sex, it just really boosts oxytocin levels. Um, which is like the the kind of love cuddle hormone, 
without blasting off the dopamine levels. And this kind of state of mind gets people just kind of like feeling like they're spiritually in the flow. And some people feel they have like experiences of like, I, I had a friend who did Kreza and he said, there's no need for like psychedelic drugs <laughs> because he was feeling oneness, um, having the Kreza style sex with his, with his uh, uh, now wife. Um, so it's just, um, and I, I had never even like heard of Kreza ever before, before reading that book. And yet to me, I was like, wow, this sounds like really amazing. Why isn't uh, people talking about this more? And it sounds like you're, you, you have a pretty big interest in like Tantra and stuff. And like the more I look into Tantra and Kreza, it seems like it's, it's this thing that's almost been like hidden from uh, the general public that could really benefit people's lives. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you probably, uh, have read the book more recently than I have. But what I recall from the book, Cupid's Poison Arrow, as well, is both her and her husband are actual researchers, too, right? Like, there's a bunch yeah. of science to, science to back this up in terms of the beneficial effects of on your hormone levels and, you yeah. know, the actual beneficial effects on the relationship. There's um, lots of science in the book, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I remember when I was reading the book, I was thinking, well, this is just like a westernized version of Tantra. Yeah. Right? In some, you know, there's a lot of, you know, Very similar. similarities there. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, as one who's had similar types of sexual experiences, A, your, your friend is right on the money. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, it's like when I found uh, meditation and tantric sexual principles, my urge for basically any kind of psychedelic substances or even alcohol kind of just went down. Uh -huh. um, I'd say That's more awesome. so, yeah, things like marijuana and, and you know, it's like, I'm really into natural highs um, uh -huh. because they're more sustainable and they're just more, more fun. I think. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, yeah, it's and and you you know you mentioned earlier about the mediocre one night stands and stuff. I mean, I yeah. can re I can relate to that as well. And one thing I found too is that be careful because once you have some of these beautiful you know um, non ejaculatory orgasm type sex and you have these kind of beautiful you know tantric connections or, or, you know, Carezza or whatever you want to call it, you know, one night stands start to seem even less appealing because uh -huh. it's like once I've, you know, it's like once I've had this amazing, you know, four star dinner prepared by this French chef, why would I want to go to McDonald's? Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that it's, makes a lot of sense. it's pretty far out really. Yeah. And, and, you know, like when you say, at least I've found when you talk about these things with, with some people, particularly Westerners, they give you kind of blank stares or they assume you're just some hippie, you know, living yeah. in northern, northern Thailand who's just, you know, <laughs> which is kind of true. <laughs> I'm kind of guilty of that. Um, but like a lot of these, these basic principles and these basic exercises and these ideas, like they're available to everyone. Yeah. And it, particularly in the West, like there's no denying we have a hell of a problem on our hands yeah. maintaining monogamous relationships. Big problem. There's all kinds of, you know, discussion and debate going on about you know, open relationships and swinging and polyamory and, and, you know, monogamish and all these, you know, these new ideas. Yeah. Um, and for me, I think, you know, I see personally in my own life um, as one with a very high sex drive and I love women and stuff. I know for me, you know, if I'm going to make uh, another real stab at monogamy again, you know, these principles are what's this is the way, as far as I'm concerned, you yeah. know, to, to stay uh, in a monogamous relationship and be happy. Yeah. And, you know, I think most guys have had the experience of you're in bed with a woman, you ejaculate, and then you either want to roll over and go to sleep or you want to leave or you kind of want her to leave. You know, you kind of just yeah. want to get some rest. Yeah. Um, but when you have this type of what, what do you call it, Kareza or tantric sex or whatever, mm -hmm. your desire for your partner doesn't go down, it goes up even after sex and you're kind of filled with this vitality and this just kind of very, I don't know, like this grounded presence and this like very grounded, excited energy that colors the rest of your life and colors the relationship, obviously. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's pretty far out. So, um, so you've had some, a decent amount of experience with Corazza and yeah, Tantra. And yeah. And a couple of relationships I have. Yeah. Very cool. And it's, um, yeah, it is as good and better than advertised, I would uh -huh, say. Yeah. yeah. Um, Very cool. Yeah. 
How uh, so? You've been dipping your toe into the into the waters of tantra. Actually, in the podcast yeah. recently, I was talking to uh, Uriel. So one very of the cool. I, the I saw that on your website. Yeah, I, I listened to to a bit of that. Cool. Yeah. How? Uh, what are you thinking of the whole tantra scene so far? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for introducing me to that class. Yeah, it's sure. it's been excellent. Yeah. Cool. I I've, I've been twice so far. Um, I plan on going tomorrow, and um, yeah. So I'm I'm still dipping my toes and I'm not super familiar with it, but based on my first impressions is that it's extremely aligned with my, my interests. Um, I imagine Uriel doesn't masturbate. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, uh, I think he, he revealed once it's been like years and years. And years. <laughs> yeah. You should like any, any tantric person listening. This is like pff, two years, dude, yeah. <laughs> 20 years. You know, like, <laughs> kind of funny. Um, but yeah, and just the the ideas of like circulating one's energy, like I'm not familiar with that. And I think that could really help me. Yeah. I'm also a very like mental person and very, uh, I have lots of anxiety lots of times and just overthinking mm -hmm. and stuff like meditation and yoga and the tantric philosophy just to get me more into my body um, really appeals to me. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad to hear. Yeah, but thanks for introducing me to that class. Oh, yeah, I, no I really worries, appreciate man. that recommendation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wrote this, this book several years ago about kind of an embarrassing chapter of my life. Uh -huh. um, and at first I put a pen name on the book, okay? And I wasn't planning on doing anything with it. About a year later, I was persuaded to put my, my real name on it yes. and, you know, start making YouTube videos and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was not all that easy for me, you know, to, to own up to some of this stuff. Uh -huh. What, I mean, what, was it a difficult decision for you to start... I mean, it's one thing, to, I, I see it's one thing to make videos about picking up girls and having fun. Yeah. It's another one to talk about, hey, I have a problem with pornography and I jack off all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. was that a, was that a yeah. difficult thing for you to do? How has your experience of that, of that been? Um, it, it definitely required some vulnerability and courage, but uh, it wasn't, like, uh, it wasn't that difficult for me. Uh, for me, um, I, I think just, like, if I was talking if this was four years ago and I was talking face to face with people, I, I'd be very, when I first started this, I'd be very uncomfortable, um, sharing it with people in person. But when I'm like alone with my tripod, <laughs> I became a lot more comfortable. It was really, um, so like uh, you, you found that more comfortable than having say like a conversation then, with, with one person, like the, a friend um, bit back then four years ago. Wow. And, um, like, I, I I could just almost do like a journal. It was almost like a journal video, like going out to the just, entire world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then uh, I think because I upload on YouTube and I don't see how people react, like their facial expressions, but just see the comments. That uh, in a way, I, it started off almost like disassociating myself, but my true self. Like I I didn't actually think too much about how people would. I I just felt like a calling to do it. Um, so I like, yeah, so for some reason, just doing it online, um, made it a, a lot easier for me. And I think also just, I had digested so much personal development and spirituality and just all this stuff that, um, my personality five, six, seven years ago was, I, I was always introvert and I, I, I quite often felt like dominated in conversations and I wouldn't really bring up and share my own thoughts and ideas with people very much. But at the same time, I felt, hey, I, I have some valuable thoughts. So part of it was, was also, uh, I felt like I was kind of uh, repressing lots of the stuff in my mind for years and years with just my, my friends and people in my life. And I just had this like shaken bottle that just, that just had no release. So part of the appeal was YouTube was just getting some stuff out of my mind, out into and, and expressing it. And I found like, it was very therapeutic just to uh, share my thoughts on YouTube. So to me, it actually was, it, it was kind of a natural process. It wasn't, um, it wasn't, it didn't require that much courage or vulnerability. It, it required some, but it was, it was kind of easy for me. <laughs> That's interesting because I would feel, I think in a lot of ways, I would feel much more comfortable revealing my darkest secrets to you, even though I uh -huh. don't know you that well, <laughs> than a video camera going out to the entire world. Huh. And I think most people are probably <laughs> kind of like me. So yeah, I think that's that really interesting yeah. that you, uh, you kind of, you know, have the opposite perspective. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, what, what, what made you decide to 
change from the pen name to your real name? How, how, how did that happen? Well, I, to be honest, I think it was similar. I think I felt like this is important. Uh, and I think that it would have a really beneficial effect for a lot of people if they could actually see someone's face going through this particular uh -huh. issue. Yeah. They would know that it wasn't some guy online just trying to make a buck, that I'm, you know, I'm actually a real human being. Um, I actually care. Yeah. And I'm not going to hide behind a pen name. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I think I wanted to have a closer connection with the people reading my book and, mm -hmm. and reading my blog and, and going through you know, my videos and stuff. I think it was... Very cool. Yeah, I think it was motivated by a similar sense of almost obligation. It was like, well, if no one else is going to talk about this, to hell with it. I, you know, uh -huh. I'll, I'll be the guy. Um, yeah. yeah, I think probably, that's probably true for me. Very cool. What, uh, what kind of comments, like what kind of relationship do you have with your audience? Or like, what is that experience like, been actually like, interacting with people who are watching these? Oh yeah, um, I, I, I have an awesome relationship with my audience, yeah. I um, get tons of supportive comments encouraging me and tons of people Hey, look, I'm on day 52. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was reading some of them and I was surprised because YouTube is usually such a cesspool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> YouTube commenters are not known for their it's grace and civility. The worst you're, form you're, of human interaction oh, often. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. But your commenters seem relatively cool. Like It seems like a yeah. lot of positivity. Yeah. Um, here and there, I get haters. and uh, Yeah. and But um, overall, it's been very positive. Yeah. Do you have any kind of YouTube strategy or, or like you know, what are your, what's your long-term vision, that kind of thing? Yeah, um, it's really just to keep making videos, and I thought maybe sometime in the future do some, some live public speaking, maybe some seminars or something, but, um, it's really just to keep going on YouTube, um, nothing too complex, and see where it leads me. Do you have any, like, overriding philosophy when you make videos, like, any kind of? <laughs> uh, I try to be, honest and real, um, as honest and real as I can. And I try to focus on, well, making this video uh, help the person who's watching it. So I, I, I like to think, how is this video going to uh, impact the world? Is this going to make the world a better place? Or is this just my ego yeah. looking for validation? And sometimes there's an overlap. But um, I, 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 I do put lots of thought into, is this really actually valuable to, uh, to my audience? I'm glad you do. And I, I think that more people like you and I, you are quote unquote content creators, which sounds so <laughs> hollow and awful. Yeah. You know, there's this emphasis on volume, right? Like just put out more stuff, keep putting yeah. out more. Bl but it's like, I don't know. I'm a firm believer in quality over quantity. Me too. So nice. yeah, I'm, nice. I'm, yeah, to I'm glad that. to hear yeah. that. Yeah. And we need to get Luke to 100,000 subscribers <laughs> because then you get a plaque, right? And life is all about social validation and material possessions. Once so I get that plaque, I'll be set. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no more worries. There you go. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, for, uh, thank you for joining me today, Luke. This yeah. was really nice. Yeah. Um, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. It, it's been a, a pleasure talking. So thank you very much. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And you can find Luke on YouTube. Just put in Gold Jacket Luke. You can also find links to the books we mentioned and the videos we mentioned in today's podcast at humansinlove.com. I am off to get some Laotian pho, a nice Lao variant of the Vietnamese noodle dish. It's very good here. So I'm excited to go do that. But before I do that, I'll remind you that ratings and reviews are absolutely crucial for any podcast success. So if you dig the show, please be sure to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast app of choice. Signing off from Vientiane Laos, I'll remind you that life is short, far too short to be spending all your time having most of your sex with yourself. Thanks for listening, folks. I'll talk to you again next Tuesday. Mm -hmm.